So we'll talk about open protocols and really open methods as a whole within the context of open research. So when you think about research, we have researchers doing in this instance here, some kind of lab research, but it may not be lab research. And we do quite well, and there've been a lot of initiatives about making sure we have access to the research papers, to the code and the data, and even the citations. But there hasn't been anywhere near the same level of focus on making sure that we actually have open methods all the time. So whatever's in the paper, if the paper's open access, then you'll have access to what part of methods is presented in the paper, but that may not actually be very comprehensive. Um, and so if we start thinking about reproducibility of research and what it is that it's important to have as open for research, the data is great, but if you don't know how you actually derive the data, it's not as helpful as you think in terms of actually figuring out how it was generated and what it means, because you don't necessarily know how it was generated. Because well, why, why should we care? <laughs> um, reproducibility in research has had a lot of really bad, bad press in recent years. Um, some people talk about crises of reproducibility. I'm not a big fan of the crisis terminology because I think this is something that we can easily address. But it's clearly, if not a crisis, it's still a big problem. So these tweets that I'm showing kind of exemplify the issue. So in the one in the center, the person who's a biologist was looking for a protocol in a published paper. And that paper cites an earlier paper and the other paper cites an earlier paper, which cites another earlier paper. And this is gonna be pre online content for the most part. And then maybe eventually you hit a paywall and you just can't access that information. So in that instance, this researcher was clearly very frustrated. And so the, the tweet shows this really nicely as they toss the laptop out the window. Uh, it may be that previous experimental information is only in um, the real kind of details of it might only be in someone else's lab book from years before. And that might have had many coffee spills or been torn or lost or just be illegible essentially by the time you come to look at it. But that, you know, and scrolling through someone else's handwritten notes is not a task I think that anyone would relish <laughs> thinking about doing. Um, but it's not just biological sciences. So the tweet on the right is from a physicist too, who hit exactly the same problem of trying to get to information about how devices were fabricated. Um, and conventional methods in the end was the answer, which is not helpful to anybody particularly. Um, and there've been some big initiatives in recent times to see if researchers could replicate and reproduce some of the results from some published studies. So this is a big study by the OSF, Tim Errington at the OSF, and they, they set out to try and replicate and reproduce the results um, that were arrived at in 50 published papers about cancer research. Um, as this quote here shows, which is from The Atlantic, a really nice article in The Atlantic by Ed Yong, um, it turned out that it was really hard to find any of the details or sufficient amount of information about the methods of, in those papers in order to reproduce them. So the part that I've bolded there, often those recipes are incomplete, missing out important steps, details or ingredients. And in some cases, the recipes aren't described at all. One of the researchers actually called this a hopeless slog. <laughs> um, and the, the initiative was stopped after they'd only tried 18 out of the 50 studies because it was just impossible. And it was proving incredibly expensive as well to actually try and perform these replication studies. So the long story short is there's a big problem actually getting to the methods information about how people were performing their research. Um, and that's where protocols.io comes in, which is the company that I work for. So we are a for profit, but the content that we publish is all open access. And our mission is really simple to make it easy to share method details before, during and after publication. Um, it's completely free to use as well if you're publishing your content. So anyone can come sign up for an account and put in the details of their experiments, their protocols, and it looks like a recipe I'll show you in a moment. Uh, and it's really very, very user friendly. So if anyone hasn't had a look, that URL at the top with slash welcome is a good place to start um, to poke around in there. And it's really versatile. It was started out for lab bench work, biological sciences, but people use it now in all research disciplines pretty much. Um, Here's an example of what one looks like. So when it's published, it pretty much does look like a recipe, but also a little bit like a publication. So at the top here, you can hopefully see there's a DOI on this published published article. So that means that you've got a permanent URL link 
to a published version that will stay static. Uh, and it's the imprimatur that's used for all kind of publishing and research, essentially. These can be your, your protocols. You can keep them private too. You don't need to make them public and give them DOIs. So you can work on them with your colleagues and fiddle faddle around as you develop them and optimize them, share them with your team as you're working on making them perfect before you're ready to publish them. They are amazing for reproducibility. They're so rich in the metadata that can be added and people can, when they've been published, if they repeat an experiment, they can tick, they can kind of press this works for me button, which shows that someone else has managed to replicate the study. It's incredibly interactive. People can comment. So it's great for teamwork. Others can comment and access and there can be full on discussions on the protocol questions about it um, and what's happening. So I'm just gonna try and move the video around because I'm blocking the slide for myself. Um, and the DOI is something that you can drop into your research article. And I'll show you how you might do that in a minute. But what's really brilliant about that is that you can also create new versions. So after you've published your protocol, if you spot a mistake down the line and want to update it or clarify something, it's become clear it's not very easy for someone to follow, then you create a new version. And if people follow the link from the published paper, they will see that there's a newer version. So in, I'll just give you a couple of examples of papers with protocols in them. So this is a PLOS genetics paper, actually contains links to 42 individual protocols. So when you've got a really method heavy paper, you can create a protocol for every single one of those. And so each of these green DOI links in the materials and methods of the paper points to its own individual um, protocol and protocols.io. And we always have the journal article link in there as well. So the two things are really well interlinked with one another. Now, 42 individual ones is a lot. A better way of doing that might have been to create a collection. So this is another example from a PLOS biology paper where the authors did exactly that. They made a collection of protocols and at the top of their materials and methods, they link to the collection DOI uh, in protocols.io. And when you follow that link, you get taken to this um, screenshot that's on the right, which is telling you exactly what I mentioned is possible before, that there's a newer version of the collection available. So that means the authors have made some changes and updated it. And if you click through, you can see the newer version. What's also really nice is that you have very easy ability to compare versions. So if you want to see what it was that they changed, you'll be able to do that. And it works just like really a word track change where you can see the two side by side and highlighted text of the pieces that have been updated and changed. Um, so I call this dynamic permanence because you can have your published paper in a journal with the link to the protocol, but because you can update the protocol really easily, the DOI gives you this permanent link out to a, to a much more dynamic document that can be really a living document and you can update it. That also means you don't have to go to the publisher for a correction if you realize there's a mistake in the method after you've published it. You can simply layer on a new version in Protocols IO. Um, why though would you do it this way rather than have a you know much more detailed materials and method? I think it's just it's so much richer to use an online tool that's more dynamic. So Another user can come in once you've published your protocol and run it, actually run through the protocol in a step-by-step -step manner, which is what this little movie shows here. You can add figures and photos and videos, kind of how to much more of a step-by-step -step guide on how to run the protocol, the kinds of things that you'd never be able, you wouldn't even be allowed to put them into a research paper. You can make this much more of a how-to guide. Um, and it's, just has the capacity to hold a lot more granular information about reagents, equipment, specific tips and tricks on how you made it work. Maybe it took you a really long time to work out the method of kind of shaking and temperature change and things to do to make a step of a protocol work. Um, there's the versioning and it's really just much better suited than writing a narrative paragraph that you would have as a materials and methods in the paper. But also it's always open access. So I mean, we are moving towards a more open access world for manuscripts, but right now they're not all open. But if you've chosen to make the methods open, at least if the paper ends up paywalled, people will still be able to get to the method details without having to worry about accessing a journal article. Um, 
we have done some really big kind of community workspaces, which were amazing, actually. And this one was really organic. And uh, it was Anita's idea to create this coronavirus method development community right at the start of 2020, when we started receiving submissions about coronavirus, various different um, techniques, sequencing or viral load or all sorts of different things. And um, we created this community is probably the largest growing one and fastest growing one we've had uh, and very organically so. So it's amazing to see how you can kind of find like-minded scientists working on similar things and create really a huge resource in this open way. Um, that's really, I mean, the pandemic is at least the silver lining is shining a huge spotlight on the need for more open science and understanding and sharing of information as we make advances as quickly as possible. And so we were thrilled to be able to support these efforts and had our editorial team help pull in protocols when scientists didn't perhaps have time to do that. Um, and making the methods protocols open on their own makes them a lot more discoverable independently of the manuscript. So the example I'm showing here, the top left tweet was someone looking for a protocol to do with RNA extraction from primary cortical neuron cultures, so neuron cells, brain cells. After several tweets, a UCSF postdoc, I think it was, um, suggested a protocol that was on protocols.io. And actually, when you click through, you see that that protocol came from a Giga Science paper. And it was a paper on three spine stickleback parasites. So it's pretty um, unlikely that a connection would have been made between neuron cultures, brain cells, and someone's work on stickleback pa parasites, fish parasites, without that method being pulled apart in a modular way outside of the paper itself. So sort of this, this modular approach to open science has really facilitated discovery and also research connections of people who use similar methodologies but in completely different contexts. So having that as an open piece of research on its own as a research output that's important independently of everything else has made a big difference in some instances for people getting the right feedback on what they should do basically. So yeah I mean I'm a huge open science advocate all around and really anything you share like this can accelerate science, increase discoverability, reproducibility, help you make good research connections, enables the reuse and it really does enhance the value of the research. There's really not a negative reason <laughs> uh, I think or negative outcome from sharing methods this way. Um, and, it's, and it helps with the stewardship of research output too. So within a lab often it's said that you're your most likely future collaborator will be you in six months time. So if you store the details in a much better format than your own scribbled lab notebook, you are actually making life easier for yourself in the future too. Um, we have a lot of support, I, I realize I'm running out of time, from journals and publishers and funders and also institutions who also recommend people use protocols.io. So uh, we're very happy to help people if they're interested in using the tool. And it's only a small company, Lenny, who people may or may not know is our founder and Anita's been there for a while too. And it's that. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, there are many, many questions. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting, uh, I'm, I'm quite aware of time, but, uh, that, but folks are really, really, um, <laughs> enthusiastic about what you've said and um, there are questions about integration about DOIs rationing so if you if you could take a bit of time sorry I have to ask this but yeah if you could take a bit of time on the hack and feeds and maybe put some answers there that would be really really helpful for, for us um, we that's I hope that's fine. Okay. I'll go ahead and do that after this that's no problem thank you so much thank you um, yeah, so totally. uh, I'm going to pass to Yo for the closing. Ava managed to find the unmute button in time. Okay, um, so this has been jam-packed full, uh, but really, really, really quite an exciting call. Um, I'm in, lo in love with how on fire the questions were also for this last talk. Um, so for now, um, we did have a fourth speaker planned. Um, we wouldn't have had time for them, even if they had been able to make it. Um, but thankfully, uh, we have a video. So right now on line 445 of the HackMD, we suggest just hop over when you have some time. That doesn't have 
have to be now and just have a look at uh, Bastian's talk about citizen science, which is another um, open science method that's really important. Um, and apart from that, uh, we actually have a, an optional cohort call next week for self-care and ally skills. Uh, I know we normally have a week off in between, but next week we have another call. We will send out more info about that, but you should have received the calendar invite. Um, the HackMD has been a pain in the rear today. I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> um, we are going to evaluate what's going on and figure out whether it's still the best option. And there is more room for any other feedback. If you want to throw any feedback right at the very, very bottom of the document, if there's any feedback you'd like to share. Um, but we are four minutes over. So I am going to say thank you very much. It's been delightful. And we will see you again later. Bye all and thanks so much. Thank you.